a 50 basis point rise in unemployment, uh, it normally leads to a recession. Uh, it doesn't just stop there. You don't just kind of go back up 50 basis points and then kind of normalize flat. You, usually unemployment mm -hmm. keeps going up. Um, and that's, you know, by, by all accounts, a recession. Uh, and so, of course, in a recession, normally you do get Fed easing. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily happen right away. It's not like as soon as you cross 50 basis points, uh, you're in a recession right away. The Fed's cutting right away. Uh, but it's just historically, that move has not happened without that over the coming quarters continuing into a recession. Uh, now, I was hesitant to say at this time that some of those rules like that um, are potentially a little looser in this environment because, um, you know, we've never had a kind of this divergence between fiscal policy and monetary policy before. In general, uh, the Treasury tries to maintain a pretty kind of um, static ratio between T-bill issuance and longer duration bond issuance. Um, and they're, the problem now is that they're releasing more into the market than normal. There's just The deficits are unusually large, especially um, outside of a recession or other kind of crisis event. Um, and so there's just kind of like this ongoing quarter by quarter deluge of supply um and the fed's also doing quantitative tightening so they are um you know letting they're, they're selling through mat uh, maturity they're, they're letting uh bonds mature off their balance sheet and not reinvesting those proceeds which is effectively a sale um because the dollar index is strong there's not a lot of foreign demand at the moment uh that's that's unintuitive to people but basically when the dollar is strong usually um the foreign sector is not really buying a lot of treasuries they're often more in, in currency defense mode um and if anything they're you know they're they're either selling reserve assets or they're they're more often just holding flat um Whereas when the dollar is weaker, they're they're more likely to be in reserve accumulation mode, and so they're not really, on average, buying at the current time. And then also banks are, uh, you know, kind of carefully managing their duration. And for the first time in a long time, they had an absolute drop in the you know the number of treasuries they were holding. And so with all of these buyers off the table, and how much supply is coming, uh, that means basically all of it has to be absorbed by the domestic non-bank sector. Um, so insurance companies, pensions, asset managers, households, hedge funds, uh, uh, and these are entities that generally don't have all this extra leverage. For example, the banking system has leverage, the Fed has leverage, uh, but these are, these are less flexible balance sheets to absorb all of this. Um, and one of the remaining pools of capital, uh, pools of liquidity available is the reverse repo facility. That you can kind of consider that like a spillover uh, for like ex excess demand for T-bills specifically, not for longer duration, just kind of T-bills, like cash equivalents with, with no pa counterparty risk. I mean, your counterparty is the Fed. Um, and so money markets could easily uh, replace some of their reverse repo exposure with more T-bill exposure. So right now, there's, you know, there's a tr at least a trillion dollars worth of, of T-bill exposure that could rapidly be... Um, consumed by the market, uh, which is not always the case, but that's the case right now. Whereas there's clearly a, a more limited demand for longer duration, like T notes, T bonds. Um, and so rather than just the treasury kind of keeping with their normal cadence and their normal um, split of how they're doing things, they've been very aggressive on the T bill side, um, which is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's, it's the more expensive part of the curve. Uh, so the treasury has to optimize for a couple of things. One of them is trying to minimize expense for the government. Um, and yet we have an inverted yield curve and they're still issuing on excess amounts on the short end. Um, but number two, they're also doing that to not hurt liquidity. Uh, they don't want to draw, you know, value out of bank reserves. They'd rather kind of pull from this reverse repo facility. Um, and so basically it just kind of, it was like a, a bigger than normal jump uh, for what the treasury would do. I think it's one of those things like it's, it's a, it's just a, not something that most people follow you know the the quarterly refunding of treasuries is it's usually a boring thing um but this was the probably the first time where a treasury refunding announcement probably moved markets more than a, an fomc announcement from the fed uh just because there was kind of more of interest there and in some ways the treasury has been affecting liquidity conditions as much or more than the fed lately and so these these two two forces have been kind of at odds and so it's interesting that there's another variable there that can you know surprise us one way or another quarter by quarter and so the challenge is that as you get higher and higher public debt interest rates become a less effective tool for slowing down the economy because you know if you have low debt and a lot of bank lending and you raise rates a lot 
you slow down bank lending more than you blow out your deficit. You know, a little bit of both happens, mm -hmm. but the lever is bigger on the on the reduction of, of private credit. Whereas if you have like average or sluggish bank lending and you have very large public debts and you dramatically raise interest rates, uh, you do, you know, slow down bank lending, which wasn't that significant to begin with. But then you also are now pouring out very large deficits into the economy. And someone's on the receiving side of those deficits. And while they might not have a velocity of stimulus checks, they have a non-zero propensity to spend. You know, some of that some of that money is just, you know, if you just if you give a, a billionaire more money, they're probably not going to spend it. But if you give a lot of upper middle class retirees more interest expense from their, you know, their money markets, um, and they've they've got a locked in fixed rate mortgage, um, higher interest rates basically stimulate them. It gives them more spending power. And that's, you know, it's one example of many. But basically, when you look at all this interest expense from the U.S. federal government, there are entities on the receiving side of that. And, and some of them do spend. In, in, in these past 18 months or so, we are growing pretty slowly. Uh, and even for a period of time, we're reducing. Not really anymore. But yeah. mm -hmm. for a period of time, you're reducing. And that's because the Fed's QT, uh, especially when they do, when they basically are <laughs> affecting non-banks, uh, that can reduce the money supply around the margins. Um, and so there was some destruction of money. And also, they did slow down the rate of, of bank loan creation. So we kind of flatlined in terms of U.S. aggregate bank loan creation. So you kind of either destroyed money or slow down money with those levers while the fiscal side was still adding to money. So I think temporarily, uh, you can you can pretty much do anything temporarily. Um, so you had this 40% surge in money supply. And then since then, they've been kind of trying to get it back down to the, the prior trend line. Uh, I think basically once we get to that point we talked about before where the reverse repo facility runs out, uh, once they go back to a period of gradual balance sheet expansion um i think that's when you have a period of kind of money supply reaccelerate uh back towards or slightly above its its normal baseline trend um and i've also been looking at another metric which is similar to m2 but basically i look at bank deposits plus currency circulation plus money markets uh which is a, a similar but slightly different metric and you'll okay. generally see that that has not slowed down to the degree that m2 has um, because for all intents and purposes, people treat their money markets like cash, um, even though it can consist of T-bills and commercial papers and reverse repo and all these kind of wonky things. It's for all intents and purposes money. A T-bill mm -hmm. is in many ways money, uh, even though it's debt. Uh, dollar bill is a liability of the Fed. It's a type of debt in, in a sense. But basically, T-bills are money-like in a closer proximity than, say, stocks or long-duration bonds are. And so things like money markets or the the um, assets inside of money markets uh, can be very money-like. And so in that sense, money supply is still growing pretty substantially. Lynn Alden, a finance pro, is sounding the alarm things are shakier than we thought. She's pointing out some serious issues that could be worse than expected in the economic world. Alden's advice is to take a closer look at what's going on and rethink strategies. As the global money scene changes, her insights are like a guide, helping folks figure out what to do in this uncertain situation. Alden's got her finger on the pulse, and it's a heads up for everyone in the financial game. If you found this video helpful, make sure you hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.